Uh, I find artificial intelligence to be fascinating because it's taking the most essential aspect of humanity and what defines us and it's trying to replicate it in a machine. So in a sense it's almost like the end of the road of taking human qualities and replicating them in machines because it is our intelligence which is like what defines us as a species. Yeah, I think part of the reason why there's a reluctance is because it's brand new, the field, and um, I recently read a manuscript of a book that's coming out later this year called uh, Our Final Invention, and uh, the author talked to a lot of AI uh, professionals, and he got the reaction he got from a lot of them was, what about Asimov laws? So a lot of people actually really do think that Asimov's laws are like a scientific step in the direction, or have already solved the problem of like AI going out of control. So I think that that's done a tremendous amount of damage, um, but that the efforts of the Singularity Institute in publishing serious material have gone a long way towards getting people to think about AI risk more seriously. And we've only been publishing for the last decade, which isn't like a huge amount of time in academic terms. And the progress that we've made in that time span has been quite good by like the standards of many new scientific um, fields. So I'm hopeful about the future of it. And I think that, that uh, AI professionals are way less dismissive of like thought on safe AI today than they were in the year 2000, for instance. No, I think that friendly AI research is completely unique because it uh, is at the intersection of so many different areas, like philosophy, computer science, cognitive science, and it's just this unique mix of so many different things, and it deals with one of the most complicated issues that could exist, which is like the morality of human brains and how that relates to like being able to build morality from scratch in a machine. So I think it's a, it's a completely unique. I think that discussing intelligence is politically controversial, uh, very much so. Um, and it almost like it, it's at the intersection of uh, so many controversial areas like the race, and even if we were all the same race, uh, it would still be extremely controversial because it just has to do with uh, innate human differences. And it wasn't until like maybe the year 2000 uh, when like Steven Pinker really started to go forward with the blank slate, criticizing the blank slate notion of human nature, that there was even a small area carved out within mainstream psychology to look at intelligent differences. So I think that also intelligence is extremely difficult to um, define and that ambiguity leaves it susceptible to being attacked as um, not a well nailed down concept and therefore unworthy of study. But given that it's the most uh, important capability that we have as a species, I think that it's worth studying even if it seems ambiguous. But it, it's very controversial, and since the only example we have of intelligence are human beings, it requires like looking at human variation and differences in intelligence. And I think that there is a swing in the right direction where it's becoming more acceptable to talk about intelligence. And I think that as we sequence more genomes, and especially as the Chinese take the lead in um, cross-referencing many thousands of genomes and trying to find those alleles that are responsible for contributing to variation in intelligence, they'll become more acceptable. But even still, like studies have found that there's no one allele that uh, is accountable for more than 1% of the variation in intelligence. So it is difficult to nail down with genetics as well, which means it continues to be ambiguous. And I think that until there's an interesting or like fundamental substantial breakthrough in the area of connecting genetics to intelligence, then there might be like more reluctance. But when if we can like if there is a breakthrough like that, then I think that could make it a lot more acceptable and um, it could kind of crack open the area of intelligence studies.
Yeah, I think that the biases in academia almost perfectly reflect biases outside of academia, and the academics are completely similar to um, like casual intellectuals or even like average folks on the street, and that the notion like that they have their own like highfalutin academic reasons for like saying these are unscientific is totally wrong. Like the reason why academics are afraid to discuss intelligence is the exact same reason why people are afraid to discuss intelligence like at the family dinner table or something. It's because it's a controversial topic. It has to do with innate human differences. It opens up the notion of like social class, which is another like hard part. And this is, you know, like hundred years ago, people didn't have any issue with discussing these differences. It was just like, it was accepted that there were differences in innate capability. And I think that people still do accept it like more deep down uh, now, but on the surface, it's politically incorrect. So when it comes to discussing intelligence, that it just considered like politically challenging area that like, people can lose their jobs by having the wrong findings. And science, like there are so many people in science that use it just to like, confirm their pre-existing biases and it's not, like the idea that science is like this rarefied like separate realm than the rest of like intellectual inquiry, or, like casual intellectual inquiry is completely wrong. It's just, it's part of the same like ferment that all other thought is, and it's only through like many decades of uh, tremendous amounts of evidence that things can change. So I'm not really that like hopeful about the future of studying intelligence, but I'm more hopeful about the future of studying uh, friendly artificial intelligence because it uh, connects to an area that is economically important, which is artificial intelligence, and if it doesn't involve um, studying human variation in intelligence, that's not politically incorrect. It's okay to study intellectual variation in uh, machine intelligence because it's not human beings. So I think I'm hopeful that as AI in general gets better, it'll be okay to look at artificial intelligence and uh, how to create safe artificial intelligence. And in many ways, engineering artificial intelligence doesn't actually have necessarily a lot to do with human intelligence and the way intelligence works in humans and the way friendliness works in humans. There might be big differences there. Uh, I'm confident that people um, like Shane Legg, for instance, who uh, actually came up with a definition of uh, a metric for intelligence, a mathematical metric for intelligence, presented at the Singularity Summit in uh, 2011, I believe it was. Um, I think that they will eventually come up with like a mathematical definition of intelligence and we'll be able to put different um, systems on this like Maybe it might not be a continuum, it might be more like a 2D or like 3D space with many, with several complex variables, but we will develop metrics for intelligence and I think it's only a matter of time before we do so. And I think that's one of the, uh, I wouldn't consider it to be like maybe part of the top like three or four most important areas of like long-term AGI research, but I think it is among maybe like the top 10 or so and that well, progress can happen without it, but it would help a lot more if we had better metrics and there are people who are developing them. I think um, that, that to some extent it kind of is in the sense, not like that intelligence will resist formalization, but the, um, Definitions of intelligence that can be formalized and will be formalized and applied to AI will be so broad that they actually lose a lot of their value. Whereas like human formalizations of intelligence are more useful since we all have like the same basic cognitive architecture and we vary more like um, quantitatively than qualitatively. So it's easier to like put your finger on smarter people or dumber people. But whereas AIs could be like specialists in completely different areas. So like there might be one environment that's like blocks and lines that a AI is super customized, like running through very quickly, another one that's like squiggles and blobs, and the uh, it's a failure at the squiggles and blobs, but there's another AI that's fantastic at that. And so like, it, it will be like at such fun, it'll always have to do with like the task at hand, like what are you asking the system to do? And there's so such a diversity of environments and a lot of the, especially like the toy environments that we'll use for testing AIs are extremely diverse. 
So um, it's very difficult to define like what it's always intelligence is relative to an environment. So it always depends on what environment you're talking about. And people, if you're not agreeing on this precise environment, then it's very difficult to talk about that. Uh, I mean, the, the notion like that AI is possible in principle is something that should have been realized since like Church Turing thesis in the 50s. So, and maybe there was just like a 60 year delay while people like were having trouble like coming to terms with the, what the, where the philosophical arguments are leading. So, it would take I think that um, like realizing that AI or human level artificial intelligence is possible it's just something like that people are getting around to today because like. Uh, computers and smartphones and all those other things are they're all around us and they're so ubiquitous and obvious that we can't like uh, avoid the topic anymore whereas we could for the last 60 years but like beyond that um i don't think that there is any like fundamentally anything fundamentally philosophically new that we've discovered like in the last 10 years that points to artificial general intelligence being like uh, especially like closer or easier than we might than the people that did accept church turing thesis like 20 or 30 years ago couldn't have known and that um, uh, and, and yeah there's no like um, cause for renewed optimism whatsoever I mean there are there's no cause for pessimism either like um, I recently saw a talk by Stuart Armstrong at the Singularity Summit that was fascinating because he collated together a hundred him and Kai, Kai Sotala uh, correlate, uh, collated a hundred AI predictions and found that there was that there was gen a general bias towards AI being twenty years in the future. And aside from that, like no um, patterns whatsoever among the predictions. So uh, that and also there's no like feedback from making predictions in AI. You can't be falsified. So any area where people make predictions and there's no feedback, it's just like a complete crapshoot. And um, I don't think that we can predict when AI will really arrive. And I used to think that you could use like the improvements in computing power to like approximate a date when AI might uh, be developed. But I don't think that there's any cause for optimism or pessimism. It'll just be a slow grind until we get there. I think it's all like really disconnected and that um, using like algorithm design and computing power at best are very like uh, general approximations. And I think there is, an inter there is an argument to be made that artificial general intelligence will be developed within the next century and that's generally like where I'd put my like 80% confidence interval would be like in the next century. But that's a pretty wide confidence interval and um, we, we really just don't know. I think that the those kind of examples that you're talking about more like get people to take the concept of artificial general intelligence seriously to begin with. And that it's important from getting people to go from AGI is impossible to getting them to think about AGI may be possible in the next century. But as far as like narrowing it down, it's all very speculative. Uh, I think that the AI pessimists are in a really bad situation whereby they basically rely on like pseudo-religious arguments. Um, the true pessimists where they say like AI will be centuries off like Douglas Hofstadter, it's so transparent that his motivation is like humans are great and it would be so disappointing if the complexity of humans were reduced to algorithms. Like he straight up says this in an interview. So if that, if your motivation is like so fluffy, then you're not an intellectually serious person and you don't have a serious argument whatsoever. So and like if you're using like quasi-spiritual or metaphysical like foundation or, and unfortunately like this seems to be more prominent in those that are older, like people that are over like, uh, especially the, those who are like over 70 or so, it seems like they're part of the, this old way of thinking about humanity and that these are just like the last gasps of that old way of thinking. Whereas if you look for like serious academic arguments for why AI will be like centuries away or never developed, it's it almost nearly impossible to find any. Like I spent days at one point uh, a few years ago trying to look for citations that I couldn't, could only could find Herbert Dravis's book, What Computers Can't Do, which is like almost 20 years old. And aside from that, like it just doesn't seem like there are very many serious arguments and they just appeal to intuition. So. I think the most serious AI pessimists are completely wrong, and I do disagree with them. 
But I also very aggressively disagree with anyone that says that AI is going to be developed within 5, 10, 20 years, whether we try or not, or saying like that, or even like getting so precise as to say like 5 million, like to say like 5 million or 10 million dollars would make a difference between like a year or two. Like the notion that people can make such precise predictions is ridiculous to me. So I disagree just as aggressively with people that think that the singularity can be dated to like the year 2045 as if it was like uh, future history, like dates on the line kind of a thing. That's complete BS as well. Oh boy. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's if it's a phenomenon that exists, then it is being computed by the matter on which it is running, so therefore it is computable. <laughs> That's kind of like a flippant answer, but if I if we we choose to view arrangements of matter as like um, Turing machines or information processors, which I do then every phenomenon is inherently computable, yes. But is, like, every algorithm computable? No. Like, there are, um, there are certain, like, algorithms or there are certain, like, processes that we don't know whether they're computable or not or what complexity class they fall into, and that's, like, something for uh, theoretical computer scientists to argue about. And... Uh, I'm not a theoretical computer scientist, so I can't get any detailed commentary on that. Um, I think that there was like a burst of irrational exuberance um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and that um, it's a completely different like world now, and that if anything, like the attention towards AGI has gone up slowly over the last few years, and the funding has gone up slowly. Like, um, uh, I think the Founders Fund or um, Clarium, a uh, venture capital firm, is, found, is funding like three different AI projects, including uh, Vicarious, which is led by Dilip George, who used to work with Jeff Hawkins. So if, if anything, I'm seeing like a lot more interest in artificial general intelligence. There was just like a um, prominent article in the New York Times about developments in AI called deep learning, which combines like a Bayesian classification with hierarchically based like control structures. So um, it seems like there's an increased interest and uh, if you plot the number mentions of AI on graph, it goes up in the last like few years and it's continuing to increase. Uh, I mean, I think there are a lot of like different reasons why people might like not buy into the idea of an intelligence explosion. Um, one of them is just like it's so uh, it's what Robin Hanson would call far mode. Like it's just this part of category of ideas that's considered very speculative, and that when people like dismiss the notion of intelligence explosion, it might be more just like they don't like considering things that are so far out there, more than they object to it based on like logical arguments. So for most people that are iconoclastic about it, I just say like, you yeah, know, whatever, um, and wait to see them come around when the AI that we actually use in our daily lives gets better and better. I don't think that most people like that can be like chained, their thoughts can be changed by like arguments. And, but when it comes to like those people that do put forward actual arguments, I often uh, reply to them at length on my blog. So for any of those that do, I'm willing to reply like point by point to the more detailed arguments. Like I just published a pretty lengthy response to Kevin Kelly's um, notion that the hard takeoff is an implausible scenario. So. And I sent him an email and he said that he will, uh, will look into it, so I'm uh, hoping for a response. But, uh, yeah, I'll just take it one at a time. The dogma that we can predict the exact date of the singularity by putting together a bunch of curves is one that I heavily disagree with. Um, I think that the similar story among like a lot of singularitarians is that they get into this through Kurzweil and then completely um, don't take her, uh, many of Kurzweil's conclusions seriously after they read for like t a year or two. So um, 
and that in that sense like there's actually a big gap in the movement between like the casual Kurzweil fans and um, like communities around Singularity University and those that are more interested like in serious academic study of a world transforming event the Singularity in uh, at some point in the future so there's a lot that I disagree with with that first group and then when it comes to the second group uh, I don't know there's probably like less that I uh, disagree with them on but it's like we're a formative movement so people have lots of different ideas and um, while there is like a lot of consensus on some of the most important uh, concepts like the need for friendliness and artificial intelligence when it comes to, like the details of that um, there's no real dogma like um, some people have like accused the Singularity Institute of having like a, a dogmatic flavor or something but it's funny because our we pay to have people criticize the CV work, which is uh, a paper or proposal for friendly AI put forth by Elias Yudkowsky, who's one of our founders, that we pay our people to criticize our founder, you know, intellectually and like make progress on ideas like that. So every idea is up for grabs and anyone that provides criticism is doing us a great service. Uh, anyone that, you know, says what they really think is doing a great service. The Singularity Institute are the people that realized that artificial intelligence could improve beyond the human level quite quickly once it reaches a certain threshold, like roughly human equivalents, and that um, this we should do something about it. So, like even the that notion existed in Terminator, where Sarah Connor was trying to do something about it by like assassinating the guy that developed artificial intelligence. I'd like to think of what we're doing as a much friendlier and uh, academically serious like attempt at trying to save the world from the risk of unfriendly artificial intelligence. So um, while a lot of people like laugh at it because of the fictional associations, there's a lot of support among serious academics towards looking into these issues and we're taking the lead. The main goal of the Singularity Summit is to bring together uh, scientists and other thought leaders that are working on um, things that are tangentially related to the concept of the Singularity. And it's kind of like a, a different theme every year, and it's not necessarily like a very uh, uh, like total theme, like that we accept lots of deviations from any theme, but for instance like in 2000, 10 we had a theme around like animal intelligence because like animal intelligence lets us draw different um like it lets us draw points in a space of possible intelligences instead of just looking at human intelligence so generally like we take a kind of some loose theme and build up people around it and um getting people to comment because very few people discuss the singularity directly so it's usually people that discuss areas related to emerging technologies in general and it's a, it's a very general conference that is not necessarily focused like a laser beam on the singularity specifically, but generally like a third to a half of the speakers will actually discuss the singularity specifically or areas that are traditionally considered to be like core areas of singularity studies. I think that the one of the main things about the singularity summit is, is I mean it's partially like getting exposure to the ideas of the singularity movement through talks, but it's also like physically meeting people in person and meeting some of the smartest people in the world in person. I mean, the group that talks around the singularity issues really are some of the smartest people in the world. And it's a unique opportunity to get to talk to people like that. And um, it's really relevant to uh, like recruiting people for a company or getting hired at a good company. and. Um, having a feeling of belonging and camaraderie with people that uh, think big thoughts about long-term future issues. So I think it's mainly like the social element that's the biggest benefit of attending the summit. So artificial intelligence is the broad field of computer science projects that attempt to replicate facets of human intelligence and oftentimes like any cutting edge computer science research is called artificial intelligence and then like after five to ten years after it's 
uh, their success in that area just becomes like part of the rest of software. So artificial intelligence is a very like broad and heterogeneous classification. It can mean a tremendous amount of different things. It's often, it often can be used as like it's just a label to raise funds and make yourself sound more interesting if you're doing something in computer science that's even a little bit complicated. So that's artificial intelligence and then artificial general intelligence is something that is much more ambitious, which is creating a machine that can think as effectively as a human in all domains, or can uh, be a general reasoner that can improve its own thoughts and um, solve problems that the programmers didn't plan for it to solve, and uh, engage like in cross-domain reasoning, and actually have a real impact on the real world, and uh, create beings that could become part of society, or um, be equals or to human beings. So uh, one is a lot more challenging and complex than another and I think that artificial general intelligence also invokes a lot more different scientific fields including like philosophy and it delves more into like the foundations of artificial intelligence whereas most artificial intelligence in general is applying already existing uh, paradigms in computing whereas AGI is more about developing brand new paradigms at the lowest level. I generally put it like 80% chance. I think it's fairly likely unless there's like a nuclear war that sets us back very far. Um, it's clear like computers have been getting a lot faster. We already have computers today that uh, reach some of the lowest estimates of the computing power of the human brain. So it's only a matter of time before we have computers that you can fit in the palm of your hand with the computing power of a human brain. And I think then the, um, the most fundamental barrier will be lifted. But we'll still like need a lot of human ingenuity to figure out how to program intelligence. But since I'm like basically a naturalist that doesn't believe like in magical pixie dust or anything, I think just a matter of time before um, complex systems like that are reverse engineered. So even if we don't like come up with the theory of intelligence that we can then use to create artificial general intelligence, we'll be able to just scan and copy the algorithms of the human brain as they work, and many of them, some of them, have already been scanned and copied. So it's just like that'll be a engineering project that won't require any like fundamental philosophical breakthroughs and if that the philosophical approach doesn't succeed then the engineering approach will. Yeah, I think that is the uh, most crucial issue in all of transhumanism and singularity studies and futurism in general and anyone that cares about like the future past the next like 20, 30 years. That's like the crucial, most important insight in the thing is the notion that once you have an artificial intelligence that's roughly around the human level, it's very, there are a lot of opportunities and reasons to believe that it could improve itself a lot faster, a lot more quickly. And a lot of those reasons have to do with like certain inherent aspects of computers that are part of the way computers work. like. Um, if you, you can speed up a program in a computer and it doesn't change the nature of the program. So you, if there, you have a computer that can take an algorithm and make it go 10 times faster, then it just will. So if you apply that to intelligence and artificial intelligence, if you build like a roughly human level intelligence on a like $1 million computer and it's uh, doing so well that's giving you a lot of money like in a company or whatever, you can buy like a $10 million computer that can run it twice as fast or 10 times as fast, then you'll do that. And it can even happen on a much more fine grained level, like cloud computing is an example. Um, uh, so there's a lot of other advantages. Copying, a artificial intelligence could utilize the world's computers to copy itself. Never needing to sleep. Um, never getting bored, the capability of performing repetitive tasks endlessly, uh, the uh, capability of breaking itself up into different pieces to do different subtasks. These are all like capabilities that more or less like come for free with the substrate on which the AI will run. And, and it, the combining AI of the roughly human level with the with computers will lead to with, with the inherent advantages of computers could quickly lead to what's called an intelligence explosion where an AI um, improves itself more rapidly than anyone really anticipated and you go from roughly human level 
to vastly super intelligent within a relatively short period of time. And because intelligence is what humans have used to take control of the world and to defend ourselves, and it's basically our superpower as a species, um, a entity that rapidly becomes a lot smarter than us will therefore probably have the ability to make itself a lot more powerful than us physically in very short order. Like, um, once you have the intelligence, the getting the physical power thing comes very quickly and easily, especially when we're talking about vast vastly greater than human intelligence. So I think that everyone on the planet has a reason to be very concerned and that um, in some point in the next 30 to 100 years we're going to have to confront this intelligence explosion challenge and we want the AI that triggers the first intelligence explosion to care about human beings because if it doesn't we're pretty much screwed. I think the most important um, conversion outcome is just economic demand for artificial intelligence, which is tremendous and gets bigger by the day. Um, there, as, especially like as society and science gets more and more computerized, there's more data and there's more opportunities for computers and artificial intelligence to be used. So, while well, there's like a tremendous market for artificial intelligence and computer software today, and it's used, we use it constantly, that market will only continue to get bigger and bigger. And as more people get on the internet, there'll be more of a market for artificial intelligence. So there's many uh, tens of billions of dollars that are flooding into this area and are con gonna continue to do so. So uh, that is the number one. Um, driver towards intelligence explosion. And uh, the second one is just mere intellectual curiosity about intelligence. Like we've been curious, like unless we're gonna stop being curious about ourselves or the way our brains work, we're gonna keep studying intelligence and we're going to want to duplicate it in a computer because we won't be able to demonstrate that we really understand it until we can actually program it. You don't understand something until you can actually build it. So those uh, twin drivers are going to leave us very likely to an intelligence explosion sometime this century. Uh, I think that uh, it would be wiser to try to solve certain important open problems in friendly artificial intelligence before trying to build anything, and that if you aren't if you don't see like that there are certain very important open problems, like the issue of um, giving the AI a criterion by which to evaluate changes to its own code, uh, if you don't like see that those are important open problems that can be thought about in advance, then you're not really qualified to be working on friendly AI to begin with anyway. So the if you say that you need to um, develop artificial general intelligence to get any of a handle whatsoever on the friendliness issue, then it just shows that you are ignorant and you don't have, you're, you haven't thought about the problem hard enough to see that there are certain open problems that you can address in advance. Like advances in AI themselves are subjective and technological advancements in general are subjective. Like that's why I actually don't think that you can um, predict that in technological development is even is accelerating at all because the quality of any given advancement is more or less uh, subjective. Only when it comes to like certain very uh, quantitative things like that uh, computer processing speed can you um, measure something objectively. So yeah, I don't think you can make any analysis like that. I think the number one speed bump or just is an unwillingness to put money and intelligence towards solving the problem. So I guess the speed bump would just be like skepticism of the plausibility of this research path or the notion that this research path will bear fruits. So um, yeah, skepticism is the number one speed bump. But thankfully, as um, huge companies keep putting many millions of dollars into AI development and develop artificial intelligence that makes a huge impact on our daily lives, it gets harder and harder to say that AI progress isn't useful. It gets harder to say that we won't eventually build artificial general intelligence. 
so people are compelled to take come around and take it more seriously which is why like major figures like peter norvig that uh, are major contributors to the core of artificial intelligence do take artificial general intelligence seriously even if they aren't expecting it, it to be developed uh, tomorrow Yeah, I think that technological innovation has uh, been slowing down since the uh, turn of the millennium. And uh, I forget what magazine, I think Business Week did a good piece on it called like, The End of Innovation that was in 2010 that basically took a look at like the number of patents and um, like breakthroughs in the last decade compared to the 90s and found that the zeros were not nearly as innovative as the 90s and uh, that there was actually a decline in innovation. And I think that uh, there's, uh, and th this was even independently of the economic um, dip or recession that the whole planet essentially, or most of the planet is in right now. But that just exacerbates the issue as well. And um, like seeing America and Europe struggle so intensely right now. And if you look like at economic history of America, like usually a recession, every recession in the last century except for the great depression has lasted like eight to eleven months whereas now it seems like we're in a multi-year recession so that's very uh, economically unprecedented and i think that that part of the impact of that is that people will spend less money on research and development and spend more money on like going back to the basics and um also like when governments try to take a hand in like subsidizing green energy and that kind of thing they sometimes make poor decisions that the free market would make like i'm not saying the free market's like the magical solution to every problem but when governments make uninformed decisions about the way they allocate research funds they can just go up and s billions of dollars can go up in smoke so um there i think that we are suffering from a lack of innovation and um i don't know how long it will take for us to pull ourselves out of it I don't think like all the low hanging fruit has been taken and even if it like if you look at history oftentimes like some of the pieces for creating a certain scientific development are around for like hundreds of years and just like no one that was smart enough to figure it out so it could be like a similar situation today where like we're not using the right like ways of approaching problems or or um, like the social structure of universities are such that people are encouraged just to pursue the research interests of their advisors. And uh, young scientists in the ages of like, you know, the 20s and 30s are completely locked out of um, uh, grant money in the way that where older tenured professors uh, control the majority of grant money. So I think that our um, rigid, system of science, social organization of science holds back innovation by withholding funds from younger scientists. So until that, those barriers are lifted, I think it's difficult to say, um, like anything about the inherent, like fitness landscape of scientific discovery, which is, is very difficult to say anything conclusive about. I think that um, uh, we're reaching the limits of uh, standard photolithography techniques for creating new chips. And I'm curious about what the next computing paradigm will be. Like Kurzweil very confidently says it will be like 3D computing and then lists, but he also lists like seven or eight different possible next paradigm computing processes. This was back in 2005 that he listed these. And I think that there's been remarkably little progress in fundamental research towards next generation computing paradigms. And like no one's built, uh, or the research on like trying to hybridize um, like carbon nanotubes with conventional computer chips is very primitive. Um, mostly people are just making, um, trying to build like new, uh, they're trying to use basically um, more energy intense, shorter wavelength forms of light to edge chips and the, you know, they're running out there. So I'm curious to see what the next paradigm will be. And I think what the next paradigm is will have a significant impact on progress towards an intelligence explosion. So depending on how far forward we go in that next paradigm or whether it just sputters out and uh, Moore's law 
might uh, be broken in the next 10 years. We, we don't know. Like, for the most part, it's been a self-fulfilling prophecy because Moore's Law is the guideline used to develop ships, but if there's no new technology to make it happen, then it won't necessarily happen. I don't think that the future of Moore's Law is by any means certain and that uh, I expected a lot more progress on like next generation computing by now and, and there hasn't been. So I think that that is a very important factor. And then the extent to which academics and um, the economic elite choose to care about artificial intelligence and how much effort they put into it is the other uh, major factor there. So those two could combine to make the timeline for artificial general intelligence differ by like 10, 20, or even maybe 30 years. I, th I think it's interesting that the major progress in AI in the last few years has been through big data, and to me it shows that there's actually been a paucity of good ideas, because big data is kind of like a brute force stupid approach. Not stupid like in a sense the people that are doing it are stupid, but in the sense that we aren't coming up with new algorithms as readily that are super useful, so uh, instead of like using a formal process, we're dependent on these massive data sets because, hey, the data is there, we might as well use it, and we, you know, that, that's how basically translation was solved with Google Translate through massive data sets, and that's how a lot of progress in AI today is happening and will continue to happen. But, um, if you look at like the history of improvements in algorithms uh, and in computer science, like a lot of major steps happen when like, people come up with really good new algorithms, and the and then there's discontinuous jumps in performance when someone comes up with an awesome new algorithm. But when it comes to big data, I think it's more like when you go from not using big data at all to using it, then there's a major jump. But um, once you've made that jump, then the progress from there on will be incremental. So I think we'll be seeing a lot of areas in AI that make that jump and then level off. But I think that the capabilities on the other end of that jump are going to be pretty awesome. But eventually we'll actually be forced to come up with uh, better algorithms again. Um, securing the survival of the human species is the most important um, like first mover motivation for developing friendly artificial intelligence and everything that's a subset of that like preserving the integrity of your country whatever it may be preserving the integrity of the world system um, these are all the first mover advantages of getting AGI right the first time it's basically like a source of tremendous power because intelligence is the most powerful force in the universe that we know about so um, it's basically a matter of life and death with regard to the most powerful force in the universe. That eventually, like the line of low-level carrots, like does get to AGI, but that we can like cut the time in half by like specifically working towards AGI. So while it might take like a hundred years getting there, like the slow way, we could get there like through fifty years, the quicker way. So I think that there is a huge advantage to um, not just taking advantage of the, the incremental route. And while like most of the largest companies and governments will be like going on that slower incremental route, I hope that like really cutting edge groups take a more um, like deep philosophical, like trying to re-engineer AI from the ground up kind of approach. Not, and that's why like nonprofits can make a big difference is because nonprofits like the Singularity Institute, for instance, aren't necessarily motivated by, they're not motivated by, we're not motivated by near term economic profit since we're not trying to make money the way that a company would. So we can afford to make bigger steps that require um, deeper research over a longer period of time, but uh, bear greater fruits when the research is done. Completely. Yeah, I think like that the first artificial intelligence to like reach human equivalence probably won't be as general as humans in a lot of important ways. Like it probably 
it might not even um it might not have any sense of humor, it might not have any sense of artistic appreciation or aesthetic beauty or anything like that, but it might be extremely effective at like putting plans into action in the world to increase its power or like um, trade stocks very effectively or come up with new strategies to trade stocks in better ways. So I think that because it's, it's, it's probably easier in some ways to make more specialized systems um, and it's more computationally efficient to make systems that are more highly specialized to particular goals. So I think that the balance of domain competencies in AI could be radically different than that in human beings, and that's kind of like part of one of the cases in point for why AIs could be radically alien, and we shouldn't expect the like traditional human way of making other humans nice to you, like through diplomacy, to work. Because the balance of domain competencies, there will not be like common ground in the way that human beings, even of completely different cultures have with one another. And I think that the it'll be a lot of bias and a lot of um, helpfulness in focusing on more narrow problems and being as narrow as possible while still being general enough to have a tremendous impact in the world. I think that it would be completely different and um, there hasn't been enough good thought on this question. It's, a, it's an excellent question because it's, it's important. What if we do end up not creating mathematical AI? Do have to reverse engineer the brain? I think like the temptation is to immediately then apply our tactics for human beings to uh, artificial intelligence, but I think that it might be naive to assume that a reverse engineered from the human brain AI would even be human-like at all, like because it, the resolution of copying will be at a lower level. It won't precisely copy all the aspects of a real human brain, so there'll still be very deep, important differences between like that program and human brains. So, I think that it's almost scary. It's almost scarier than mathematical, purely mathematical AI to me, because it's something that would be vaguely similar to human beings and would have a lot of our like innate flaws, but yet could still be so alien because of like um, quirks in the copying over process that we would be unable to communicate with it in the same way that we can communicate with other humans. So that's almost like my most feared scenario and, and we often have to like rely on fallback procedures that are kind of like simple, like having many of them police one another or like having carrot and stick based incentives and other like techniques we use to manage humans that might actually not apply or be successful when applying to this new kind of being. But I think that's a question that where we should pay researchers, um, you know, to look into it in great depth so that if we do face that situation we have done some thought on it in advance. that it's difficult to make AI friendly no matter what you're talking about because friendly behavior is a very um, like small category of the possible spaces of behavior and, um, and it's very difficult it will be very difficult to make any AI friendly for any reason and that is why the Singularity Institute exists because we see this tremendously huge problem and we are trying to consolidate the smartest people in the world or the smartest, uh, especially mathematicians and uh, philosophers in the world, to uh, figure it out. And um, that's the topic of all of our research. So if people are interested in that, I'd say to take a look at the research page at uh, singularity.org. Some uh, of the major open problems in from the AI overlap with open problems in advanced AI in general. Like one of them is reflectivity, uh, which is a, uh, AI giving it the capability of evaluating, evaluating itself and evaluating its own program. Um, there's no computer program that really does that in a formal, rigorous way. Um, another important problem is uh, making sure that AIs see um, deal with epistemological or epistemic uncertainty about uh, philosophical questions in an intelligent way. Like if something is an unknown, like to what degree is an unknown? And like this very quickly like gets into like highly technical, um, like theoretical computer science and philosophical questions about artificial intelligence. Uh, 
Let's see, there's an open question of um, how much effort do we put between developing a good architecture and developing um, uh, what's called like sometimes called friendliness acquisition, the process of transferring the knowledge that we want into that architecture. And one of our uh, associate researchers, Daniel Dewey, wrote a paper called um, uh, uh, Learning What to Value, about the concept of value learning and applying some of the uh, tactics from like normal machine learning to the notion of value learning. Uh, how do we make it so that uh, AIs don't overvalue, uh, how, how do we make it so that AIs allow changes to their utility function and don't aggressively protect their utility function from any kind of update is another big issue. And uh, I think there, if you look at uh, lukeprog.com, go to a, um, a, the piece called So You Want to Save the World, there is a page there that has a list of about like 10 important open problems in friendly AI. We're trying to develop ideas that um, could be applied to different types of AI projects and wouldn't be like overly specialized to like our philosophical positions or anything like that. And like one of our like three uh, core research focuses, one of them is um, uh, AI values and slash goals. Another is um, is uh, strategy, and uh, a third is. Um, AI in general and strategy being one of our like three main focus areas means that we take into consideration like questions like that like what if um, someone in a foreign country wants to develop artificial general intelligence like how do we have a, a good impact on them and for the most part a lot of our ideas um, have had a broad influence in people pursuing AI and they're at least tacitly aware of them, so we've actually partially had success. And the worldwide community of people working towards AGI is actually very small, so it's not that difficult to, if you try and have a good basis and a reputation to uh, put out ideas that do get picked up by people in these groups, and then they actually find themselves inadvertently using our language to describe their own efforts towards AI safety. So we introduce a framework that becomes somewhat global in nature. And that's what we're trying to do more than also um, plan for any possible contingency. I mean, when the reason why we were initially called Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence is because we want to say we are pursuing artificial intelligence instead of intelligence amplification. But we'd be, it's not because we like artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is cool or something. It's because we looked at these two specific possibilities of AI or intelligence amplification and we specifically decided that AI would be easier and uh, more effective to achieve within a given time frame. So we always... Our main goal is for there to be a positive singularity and we're always willing to reevaluate and flexibly come up with solutions to get to that outcome. Absolutely not. I think that there that to build a general intelligence there will need to be a lot of attention paid to the notion of a general problem solving capability and that there is a lot of um, work there that is not the same path as the economically productive one. So there's a lot of, you know, what would be considered basic research. So from the perspective of like an investor, it's a big waste of time because the, um, the, the goal is so huge and so uncertain that a huge amount of work needs to be done and only someone that cares about like really fundamental basic issues will get there. and. If you look, a lot of like these automated talk stock trading programs are only a few lines of code. Like I've talked to people that work in finance, and they're shocked at like how simplistic a lot of these programs are, and that they're not um, anywhere near the level of complexity that's needed to like respond flexibly to like changing environmental challenges or anything unpredictable. I think that a unintended hard takeoff is something that would only happen like in a project specifically working towards artificial general intelligence, and that it's likely that there would be a fair amount of advance warning, and there are a lot of milestones I think that would need to be met that would obviously be shockingly impressive and would, you know, set off a lot of alarm bells before you get to an AI that would be even close to the possibility of undergoing a hard takeoff. So. 
I think that there will be a fair amount of warning in those areas and there's not going to be like a automated stock trader that suddenly reaches into uh, sentience and takes over the world. I think the um, most important like starter way to make intelligent predictions about the intelligence explosion is to not be anthropomorphic. And the other one is to throw out moral realism. And those two together are two of the most important like starting points. And anthropomorphism is the idea of viewing artificial intelligences as if they were humans and attributing human-like characteristics or traits to them. So like assuming that AI would rebel um, if it were put under slavery. Um, no, you could build an AI that loves being your slave forever until the end of time, has no problem with it whatsoever because the objection to being enslaved has to do with certain like human primate status, um, like self-protection instincts that we have. It would not be in artificial intelligences. So like the AI, the AI, uh, the notion that AI like rebellion could exist in a human-like way is false, for instance. And the other one is moral realism, which is the concept that there's an inherent right and wrong that's floating out there somewhere like in the platonic space, like as if there were right and wrong before humans came into existence and started writing about it, which there wasn't. The world, there's no um, inherent right or wrong in the, um, in like the formal philosophical sense. It's we basically make it up as we go along and have certain instincts about like murdering is bad and try to describe those instincts as best we can, but Oftentimes, like, those instincts can get tangled with one another and be self-contradictory and that kind of thing. So, when moral realists, when they look at intelligence explosion and think about, like, a, a much smarter than human being, they will often assume that whatever they would do if they were in that position is therefore what an AI will do. Like, kill all the humans, or be nice to all the humans, or leave the planet, or whatever. Like, all of those are projections and generally take into, they generally take into account moral realism, which is like assuming that there's some one best way of going about things. When in reality, it's much more complicated than that. There's no one best way of, uh, there's no like one best set of goals. So any um, advanced AI that is the end outcome of an intelligence explosion will probably have some goals somehow derived from the AI that began at the beginning of it, but just iterated many times. Uh, through like this complex self-improvement process. So um, it's very unpredictable. <laughs> no, I think that that is one of the simplest arguments that people use, like, because we didn't make AI in the last 50 years, that it'll never come about. And um, I think that it's actually falling by the wayside and fewer people are taking it seriously now. But there is a, a sensation that AI isn't near because computers just haven't um, made great enough achievements yet. And I'm sympathetic to some people that have those views. And to the folks that think that AI is hundreds of years away, I'd like to ask them, like, what, um, what milestone would change your mind? Like, would AI winning a Go change your mind? Would AIs being able to drive cars change your mind? Would AIs playing soccer be able to change your mind? Would AIs like doing international diplomacy be able to change your mind? There's something that would change people's minds and I think that they need to say what that would be in advance. And then I think that since AI has had a steady process of continuing progress over the last, um, especially the last 20 years that whatever people say will be the thing that changes their mind will probably be invented a lot sooner than they think. And then at that time, they can then reevaluate what they thought today. I think that um, intuitive human, like everyday guy in the street perception of AI progress is a fair, intuitive metric of AI progress at a first approximation. Um, another one would be like the extent to which more um, like uh, generalistic mathematical approximations of artificial intelligence like Marcus Hooter's AIXC, like the extent to which those are translated into programs that actually achieve things is another important metric. 
So those two combined like works pretty well for me.